Good morning, and welcome to Valley Baptist Church. My name is Brian Robinson, and I'm the student pastor here at Valley. And whether you're joining us in person or worshiping with us online, it's great to have you today. This Sunday, we will have a camp silo meeting at 4.30 for all parents and campers. It will be in the fellowship hall. Tomorrow, we're beginning 40 days of prayer for revival. Revival will start just 40 days from tomorrow, and so we're looking for 40 individuals to pray specifically for revival for four minutes each day. If you would like to be one of them, let Brother James know by texting or just telling him today. Well, this is awkward. Today, we're having a baby shower table for this random young couple named Brian and Ashley Robinson and their upcoming baby girl, Lindley Ann. Be sure to support this needy young couple. They are registered at Bass Pro Shops, Academy Sports and Outdoors, and Colton Steakhouse. This Thursday, our senior adults will go out to eat at the Country Kitchen in Kenson. They meet up there around 11.30. This Thursday evening, we will have a youth girls' night at our intern Whitney's house at 110 Club Creek Drive. That's open to all teenagers that are ladies who have completed the seventh through the 12th grade. The youth will also have a guys' night coming up on July 25th up at the church. This is open to all guys who have completed the seventh through the 12th grade. And once again, thank you for joining us. We hope that you have a blessed day and feel at home while you're here at Valley. We are gonna have baptismal services to begin with after the announcements. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Asher gave his life to the Lord and uh, I talked to him on Friday afternoon, his mom and dad. Uh, led him to the Lord, and he came forward this morning making his decision public, and uh, so Colton's going to baptize him, and so we'll ask you to turn your attention to the baptistry. Colton. Asher, you, Mama, and me talked on the table, and last Sunday you gave your life to the Lord, uh -huh. and you know Jesus lives with you and is going to walk with you, uh -huh. and we talked to Brother James Friday, yep. and he confirmed it, and, and then you're ready to get baptized. Uh -huh. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, sharing you with him in believer's baptism. You want to live for them? Amen. Told Colton I had to practice up. You got another one on the way uh, that will be making that decision soon. Well, we're glad that you are here. What a great way to start off our service. We had a great crowd in our first service. And by the way, Brian's talking about that needy family uh, that's having a... Uh, uh, shower table. Of course, it's him and uh, Ashley. And as I said this morning in the first service, that needy family uh, is on the beach in Florida this week. So uh, uh, thank God they're making it by the skin of their teeth. But anyway, uh, we're, we're excited for them. And if you haven't brought a gift for their uh, baby girl, Lindley Ann, that'll be uh, uh, great to do that tonight when you come back. Uh, I'm not going to take much time to um, make many more announcements than he did. Uh, we do have our 40 prayer warriors, so uh, thank all of you who volunteered. So tomorrow, 40 prayer warriors will start praying for 40 days, for four minutes, one minute for uh, Bob Pittman, one minute for uh, our staff, one minute for our church family, and one minute for whoever you want to pray for, but we're going to be praying for them uh, over the next 40 days, our revival starts August the 28th, and uh, so we're looking forward to that, and we're already starting. The beautiful flowers today have been given uh, by Jenny Mabry and um, also uh, uh, Cindy Inman in memory of uh, Mabe and Keith. As most of you know, uh, both of them passed away on Tuesday. Uh, Mabe's funeral a celebration of life service was here on uh, Friday, and uh, Keith Inman's was yesterday here. So uh, it's been a, a tough week, 
uh, for us, not for them. Um, remember this afternoon at 4.30 is a Salem Springs meeting. At 5 o'clock we have our quarterly business meeting. And then at 6 o'clock uh, our marriage uh, ministry, the f entitled Foundations, will meet. Um, uh, we had a great vacation Bible school. A lot of great things happened, and uh, we're grateful for for that. Uh, the decisions that were made, and it got it, it ended on a very high note on uh, Wednesday night. So thank all of you for helping out in that. Okay, I think that is all. Uh, we're going to have a time of prayer, and uh, if any men want to join me here at the altar, I'm going to invite you to come now and uh, be at this altar with me. You can pray wherever you're at, but something about coming to the altar. As you are coming, let me just um, ask you to pray for uh, Jenny Mabry and her family and the uh, death of Mabe, and then Cindy and Autumn and Matt uh, in the death of Keith. Uh, Melanie Sparks, she had a, um, a CT scan this week. She'll get the reports this week. Many of you know that... Um, uh, Beverly, my wife's in the hospital. She's going to have an, uh, her heart's um, uh, in AFib. And uh, this afternoon, they're planning on doing a uh, cardiac conversion. So thank you for praying for her. Butch Allenball's in the hospital. Uh, Linda Pike has surgery on Wednesday. Terry Hayes, um, remember him. He goes through his uh, cancer treatment. C.W. Siler's mother uh, had a stroke and uh, uh, still very, very sick. Uh, Frank and Una McClure, pray for them. Uh, also, uh, Joe and Judy Robertson, pray for Peggy Cooper. Peggy is uh, at rehab. Uh, pray for Marilyn Cohn, uh, Holly Wilkins' brother. They're not here today because he's on hospice. Pray for Sue Durham. She's not here. Um, and uh, pray for Bobby Grimes. Also, Sherry Conley's uh, dad's in the hospital. So is Darlene Smith. And we'll pray for this service today. We we'll also want to remember uh, uh, David and Carrie Fox in Colorado Springs. We have a lot of people gone on vacation. There's basketball, there's um, um, sporting events going on. And, and uh, so remember all of those people who are traveling. And we'll pray for this service. Let's bow together and do that now. Our Father, thank you for being such a good, good father and for being with us this week. and Lord, now as we begin a new week, we ask that you would uh, bless each one that's here. Thank you for all of those who came to our first service. Thank you for those that were in Sunday school. And Lord, thank you for... Uh, just the joy to be in your house today with your people. Lord, you've heard all of these requests. There are families that are hurting because they've lost loved ones. And I pray especially for Jenny and Cindy and their families. Be very close to them. I pray for those who are in the hospital and those who are waiting on tests and those who have surgery upcoming, that you would be with each one of them. You've heard every name that was mentioned. And Lord, there's a lot of people that were not mentioned today. Uh, that uh, I pray and I pray for uh, um, uh, the Tanner family and the home going of uh, Mr. Tanner lift them up to you today as well and Lord I pray that you would uh, take charge of this service pray that if there's decisions that need to be made that they will be made we're grateful for those that were made this morning in the first service and uh, we thank you Lord for what you promised to do in this service. Thank you for each one that's here, especially our guests. We pray that everything that's done today will bring honor and glory to you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. And we ask all of this today in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Now then, we want to just take a minute to... Uh, Welcome our um, guest. If you are a guest for the very first time, thank you so much for coming. Or if you are a guest and you've never filled out one of our uh, welcome guest cards, uh, they're in front of you. 
And if you would take one of those, please, and fill it out. And when you leave today, if you will drop that in uh, one of the donation boxes out there where our people put their um, uh, offerings, uh, next to that, right close by, will be a uh, gift box. And we'd love for you to have one. A gift box is our way of saying thank you for being with us today. We're going to take a moment just to welcome you, just to say hi to you and hi to one another. And so uh, while we're doing that, our kids are going to come down for our children's sermon. So let's stand and kids come on this side right over here. Well, how's everybody doing? Great. Boy, y'all had so much fun this week in Vacation Bible School. Uh, y'all were up there singing and dancing and having a big time. Then you went to your classes. And one of the great things about Bible School is that we get to have snacks. And we had a lot of neat snacks this week, and they were yummy. And um, so... So I thought I'd bring y'all a snack today. Would that be good that we just keep it going? Well, who, who likes snacks? All right. Well, I brought you some. These are wishbone snacks. Uh, who wants one? You want one? Okay. Okay. Take a, take a little bite of it. No, 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 no. Take a little bite of it. No. The dog bone. Poor kid doesn't get anything to eat at home. And he isn't ready to, no, that, these are not kid snacks. These are for. That's a dog treat. That's what it is. It's a dog treat. I don't have a dog. So that's, I'm gonna give them to y'all. So yeah. So dog. How many of you have a dog? Raise your hand. No, just about every one of you have a dog. Okay. Uh, you know. You know what dogs like. Dog treats, don't they? Some of you do too, apparently. But dogs love dog treats. And you know what you do with dog treats? One of the things you can do with dog treats is this. You can tell your dog uh, to go get fetch something or sit or maybe roll over if they can do tricks. And you'll give them a dog treat and they will do that, won't they? Have, does your, I used to have one that he would roll over. He would fetch something if I gave him a dog treat. But... You know what that really is? It really is sort of like a bribe. It's when you kind of pay the dog to do something. You say, okay, God, uh, okay dog, uh, do this, and you give them a dog treat when they do it. And you know, sometimes, boys and girls, we're like that uh, when it comes to God. We say, okay, God, uh, do this for me, and I'll serve you. God, give me this, and I'll live for you. God, do this, and I'll be a better person. I'll be a better Christian. But can I tell you something, boys and girls? We don't need God to give us anything because God gives us everything we need. And you see, it's not like that God has to bribe us and he doesn't need to bribe us or, or give us something for us to do something. We should always want to do something for God because God is so good to us. And when we do that, then he blesses us. So... When you go home and you see your dog and you give your dog a dog treat, remember they do that just for that treat. But we serve God and we live for Jesus and we honor him because he's so good to us and he has blessed us and because of who he is. And we just want him to know that we love him. And Jesus said we will love him. If we will obey him, we will, if we love him, we will obey him, not that we get treats, but because we love him. Dogs do it because they get treats. We, love, we obey him because we love him. Okay? Will you remember that? All right. So some of y'all can have a snack after 
church. I've got them right here, okay? Let's bow together and pray. You can go to Children's Church. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And God, help us to use our lives to bring honor and glory to you. Lord, you have already been so good to us. Just help us to show you how much we love you, not for what we might get, but because of what you have already done for us. Help these boys and girls to live their lives that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's see which way you're going out. You're going out that way, okay? So, all right, let's stand. We're going to worship, everybody. Let's go. All that is within you, every breath, every ounce of passion, give him praise this morning for who he is and what he's done. Can we get the back projection on, please? Thank you. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. Hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb. The Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Church, so open up. Open up the gates, make a way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. Sing this out with confidence. Who can stop our Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord?
for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him oh, oh, oh. man won't you give him praise this rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim's pathway clouds will over spread the sky but when traveling days are shadow not a sign when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory let us then be true and Trusting, serving every day. Just one glance of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see We'll sing and shout the victory on the last. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Come on, sing that chorus again. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. I always picture somebody just starting to get down after it. When it says, we'll tread the streets of gold, I'm always looking for that one person. Like, who's going to do it this morning? <laughs> I tell you what, it's going to be a day of rejoicing when we finally see him face to face. Amen? I tell you what, man, it's going to be amazing. But until then, until then, we're going to have highs. We're going to have lows. We're going to walk through mountaintops and walk through valleys. But knowing that each time we're at that spot, Christ is right there with us. Through the hardships, through the times of rejoicing, God is always there with us every step of the way. And so we have to choose each morning when he wakes us up and gives us a breath of life. We have to say, Lord, you said let everything that has breath give you praise. And so this morning, right here, right now, God, I'm going to give you all that I got. 
And so this song simply says, yes, I will. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're walking through, choose to give him praise. Choose joy in your life for what he has done. Let's continue to worship him as we sing. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, that nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, nothing can stand against. Yes, I. Brian is on vacation. Uh, I get to read the verses today. And if you're standing, we always stand in honor of God's word. And uh, today I'm going to be reading out of James chapter 4 and verse 14. For those of you who are visiting, we are going through James in this summer, summer of James. And um, we're kind of getting a little ahead uh, because just because of the week that we've had uh, this just God just laid this verse on my heart, and I just want to share it with you today. Uh, we want to let all of our guests know once again how grateful we are to have you, 
and uh, hopefully you will you have already filled out one of those cards if not you've got a few more minutes to do that one of those guest cards that says welcome guest information if you'll fill that out and put in one of those white boxes that says tithes and offerings pick up one of those um gift boxes as a way of us saying to you thank you for being here our people will be uh, putting their tithes and offerings in, and not only are we going to pray for the rest of the service, we're also going to pray for our giving, and thank you for being faithful in your giving. So let's bow together, and as I said in the first service, when we give our offerings, it not only keeps the air on and the lights on and uh, helps us uh, do the things we need to do here locally in the church, but it has a far-reaching effect. It helps us support missionaries who are around the world today telling people have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And by you and I giving a, our tithes and offerings and being faithful to do that, we support them. And we have thousands of them that are out there today depending on us. And thank you for your faithfulness. All right. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Let's pray. And our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to be in your house again today. Lord, we ask that you would uh, minister during this time in a powerful way through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for each one who's here, our guests and our members. And especially let our guests know how welcome they are, how thrilled we are that they're here. Father, we thank you already for what you've done today the decisions that have been made, the people who came forward making their decisions to trust you as Savior. We're grateful for Asher being baptized, and Lord, we're grateful for those who've been saved this week in Bible school and all the good things that you have done. We thank you, Lord, for what you purpose to do in this service. Thank you for every person who is here. Lord, I pray that you will bless this offering and that it will be used to take the gospel around the world that people who don't know Jesus will hear about him, receive him, and go to heaven. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless our special music as Brother Daniel and Tori uh, bring that to us, speak to us through them. And God, I pray if there's anybody here today that needs to make a decision, whatever that decision is, that they would do it today. They would do it now and not wait one more day. Father, have your will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. As I think of this song that we're fixing to do, can't help but think of how blessed we are here at Valley to have Brother James that preaches the word to us so faithfully, boldly, and we have one another as a church family. And as we think of the days and struggles that we go through in life, we're here as a church family to help one another. because it's going to be worth it all one day. Listen to the message in this song. We need some spirit-filled preachers to teach us right from wrong. We need some old-fashioned seekers who pray all night long. singing to help us go another mile and the church will triumph oh Lord we'll be home a little while you'll be worth it after all child you'll be worth it 
after all, after all of these trials, we'll hear Jesus call. He'll be worth it after all, child. He'll be worth it after all, after all of this climb. When you're down in the valley, prayer is all I can do. That the Lord sends deliverance and strengthens you. When you're up on a mountain and you see me struggling alone. Lift my name up to Jesus, let's help each other make it home. He'll be worth it after all, child, he'll be worth it after all, after all of these trials. Now you know where all those dardars got all their musical ability from pops. Thank you, Brother Daniel. My goodness. They're disgusting, aren't they? Uh, they're <laughs> really disgusting. I hate them more and more every Sunday. What a blessing. Thank you for being here today. In <clears throat> almost 50 years of being a pastor, I've had some difficult days, tough days. But Tuesday was one of the most difficult days, the, one of the toughest days I've ever had in the ministry. Tuesday morning, I was at the National Cemetery, North Little Rock, to conduct a service for a veteran who was 50 years old, Jason Henderson. Jason was a young boy when I was his pastor, and I had the privilege of leading him to Christ and baptizing him. So when he died, his family called me and said, would you do his service? I said I would be honored. And so we had his service the week before. They cremated the body, and so we went to the National Cemetery on Tuesday morning. And as we had a processional that went into the cemetery, as I was driving up that street, I get very emotional especially when I get right next to the iron fence because I know that we are next to hallowed ground. 
And when we pulled into the National Cemetery for the veterans, there were several workers, many workers there, who were putting up crosses, white crosses, white tombstones, to represent veterans who had died, many in combat and many just in life. And I've never been in that cemetery, and I've been there a lot, I've never been in that cemetery that my heart is just not ripped out. Because everywhere you look, every time you see a headstone, you realize that you are among heroes. And so at 10 o'clock we had the service, and it was very emotional. I mean, when they play the taps and when they present the flag and when they do all that they do at the National Cemetery, it's very emotional. And I came back to the office, and I was, you may have read the newsletter, I was writing my article and got a phone call from Autumn Inman Spears, and she said, Brother James, Mom just called me, and she thinks Dad is about to go. So I quit everything I was doing. I jumped in the Tahoe, and I took off to Keith Inman's house, Keith and Cindy's. When I got there, Keith had died. He was already gone. Hospice was there, and I was there, and the fam- some of the family were there. And we were waiting for, they, for them to do everything they needed to do. The, we were waiting for the funeral home to come, and I had mentioned to the hospice nurse, I said, hey, have you heard anything from Mae Mabry today? I said, I just talked to Jenny a little while ago, and he wasn't doing real well. Have you heard anything in the last hour or so? She said, no, I haven't. And about 30 minutes later, she came to me, and she said, um, Mae just died. I said, what? I said, Mae just died. She had gotten a word from the other hospice nurse who was at Mabe and Jenny's. So we went, I went to Mabe and Jenny's house. And I was there with the families and the remains of both of those great guys. And I will tell you, that was one of the most difficult days I've ever had. Not, not that I was worried about where Keith and um, May were going, but I had just finished a funeral memorial service at the National Cemetery for a 50-year-old man, a 50-year-old hero. Two hours later, I was in the home of a 61-year-old Christian man. One of the good ones. And an hour and a half later, I was in the home of another 50-year-old Christian. Another good one. 50, 61, 50. What is your life? Is here for a moment, then it's gone. Some of us are old enough to remember a television show called This Is Your Life with 
Ralph Edwards. Ralph Edwards would surprise some celebrity and he would go in, maybe they were doing a rehearsal or they were doing a show or whatever, and he would just barge in. And he would go in and he'd say, Jack Benny, this is your life. Betty White, this is your life. And he had a book with him, and they had done a lot of research, and they had brought some people in. And in 30 minutes, this shows 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, they recap the entire life of Betty White, the entire life of Jack Benny, in 30 minutes. Your life and my life is a vapor. It is here, James says, the Word of God says, for a moment, and then it's gone. If this week ought to have done anything to us, it ought to remind us again of the brevity of life and the certainty of death. I see people all over this sanctuary who have suffered that loss. Lisa, Mike went home to be with the Lord. James, Brenda went home to be the Lord. On and on and on I could go. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything that you and I ought to know today from the very core of our being, it is that life at best is a vapor. Some of us who are Senior adults can remember when we were boys and girls. And how fast life, where did it go? What happened to all of those years? James tells us here hey, this is your life, it is a vapor that's here for just a little while, and then it vanishes away. So this morning, I'm just going to speak from my heart as we think about this is your life, and this is your life. A couple of things let me share with you, just two points. In this passage, in this verse, James talks about an assumption that we should never make. An assumption that we should never make. Look at verse 14 again. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What is the assumption, the assumption that we should never make. It is this, that we have tomorrow, that we have another year, another month. He says this, what will happen tomorrow? You don't know. You're not guaranteed. I'm not guaranteed of tomorrow. What's the assumption that we should never make? Not to assume that we have tomorrow. Not to assume that we have one more day. Life is fragile. Handle it with prayer. Life is like steam coming from a teapot. 
You see it, and then it vanishes away. We are only one heartbeat away from eternity. And one day, your heart is going to stop. And it will be over. This life will be over. Don't know when we're going to die, but we know that unless Jesus comes first, we are going to die. Do you know that in America in 2022, 5 million Americans, now I'm not talking about worldwide, 5 million Americans will die? Over 40,000 Americans will die this year in some type of automobile accident. And I promise you that when they got into that car or that SUV or that pickup truck that day, they never believed, they never assumed it was going to be their last ride. And 40 over 40,000 have gone out into eternity suddenly through an accident, a car accident. Sometimes you'll hear people say this, boy, I had a narrow escape. Maybe they had an accident and, and they survived. The car was total or maybe there was some other accident or there was some other uh, problem in their life or an accident in their life, and they'll say, boy, that was, that was a close call. So I've never been closer to death in all my life than then. You probably have said that. Boy, I, I was closer to death at that time than any other time in my life. Can I tell you something? If you said that, you are wrong. Because you are closer to death right now at 1122 than you've ever been in your entire life. You are closer to meeting God right now than you've ever been. I don't care how many accidents you've had. I don't care how many diseases you had or how many surgeries you had. You are closer to death at this moment than any other time in your existence. The Bible says this, ladies and gentlemen, in 1 Samuel 23, 20, verse 3, there is but a step between us and death. A step. When I was growing up, I grew, out in the, I grew up in the country on a farm out north of Judsonia and out towards White County Central. And when I started school, I started elementary school. It was Plainview Elementary School. We had um, six kids in my first grade class. Six. I was in top five. We had six. <laughs> we had three boys and we had three girls, so it was easy to pair up. That first day of school, I met a young boy I was five. He was five. We didn't have kindergarten, so I started at five, first grade. His name was Randy Huffman. Phyllis knows the Huffmans. And Randy was a dear friend of mine. We grew up together. Randy had rheumatoid, uh, he had rheumatic fever. That's what he had. And he would go to the doctor a lot. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the 1960s, late 50s, 60s. He would go to the doctor a lot, and we would just be waiting. David and I, David Miller and I, that was the other big man on campus, David Miller and I and Randy Huffman, uh, we would wait for Randy to get back from the doctor, and, and, and he became my best friend, Randy did. We did a lot of things together. When we were in the ninth grade, Randy was at my house, just right across the road from Phyllis's house. 
and we had just been playing and goofing off. It was October afternoon, and um, Randy was on his bicycle. He lived about four or five miles from, three or four miles from me, and uh, I, I actually lived on a, a paved highway. Randy lived on a gravel road. So Randy went home, and as he left, I said, Randy, I'll see you in the morning at school. He said, okay. And about 10 minutes later, my mom and dad and my brother and sister and I decided we'd go to see my grandmother, and we got in the car and drove up the road, and there had been an accident. We stopped. My mom and dad were some of the first ones there. I was in the ninth grade, my sister in the seventh, my brother in the fifth. They couldn't recognize whoever it was. He had been hit by a car, knocked him in the ditch, and the car came on top of him. Burst every blood vessel in his body. They didn't recognize him. Randy was 14. He was cutting across the highway to get on the gravel road. Car hit him, knocked him in the ditch, came on top of him, and that was it. My mom and dad and Dewey Hunt went to tell his mom and dad, Virgil and Annie Jane Huffman, what had happened to Randy. And I will never forget, as long as I live, hearing the cry, hearing the scream of a mother who has been told that her ninth grade son has just been suddenly killed. They asked me to be a pallbearer. I said, no, I can't do it. My mom said, yes, you can. And I'm glad she insisted and I was a pallbearer at Randy's funeral he died within 10 minutes of leaving my home and the last thing he said to me is I'll see you in the morning that that's what the Bible means when it says there is but a step between you me and death and I, I, know, I know what some of you are thinking this morning. It always happens this way. Uh, you're thinking, that's right, preacher, you tell them. You, preacher, you let them have it because they need to get right because they're going to die. But I'm in my 30s, 40s, 50, Jeff Free was a young man who had a heart attack just a few weeks ago and went out into eternity. Oh, yeah, it's not going to happen to me. You tell them, preacher, because you've got it figured out. You're going to live to be 100, and you're going to go to the doctor, and you're going to feel bad, and he's going to say, you don't have much time left. You need to go home and get your affairs in order. And you go home and you call your family. You're going to get them all together. And you're going to give them a big hug. And you're going to put your pajamas on. And you're going to crawl into bed and turn up your toes and close your eyes. And that's it. Can I tell you something? That ain't going to happen to anybody in this room. That's not how you're going out. I don't know how you're going out, but that's not it. That won't be it. You think you got it figured out? Your life is a vapor. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. When I was in seminary, one of my best friends was David West. David was a all Southeast Conference player for Vanderbilt University football team. Now, you had to be pretty good to even be a, guys, you would, you would know this, Butch, uh, to even be a good football player at Vanderbilt and to be an All-SEC, you had to be pretty good. And David was a good ball player, football player. But God called him to preach. He was one of the most godly men I ever met. 
He was a couple years older than I was. We were, we were working on, we were in college, a, a seminary together. We worked on our doctorate together. He was, a couple, like I said, a couple years older than me. And he was pastoring at Moro at uh, Moro Baptist Church when I was pastoring down here at Higginson Baptist Church, First Baptist Higginson. We got our first church about the same time. And we would talk every Tuesday when we came back about what happened the Sunday before. David had been to Morton, which is over by McCrory. He had been to Morton to preach a revival the year before. I was going over there this, that particular year. And David said, James, I know you're going over there to preach. He said, there is a man over there. His name is Mr. Alexander. He is an older man, and he was sick last year. He said, whatever you do, you and the pastor, make sure that you go visit Mr. Alexander because he's sick, and I don't think he's going to make it much longer. Make sure you go and see Mr. Alexander before he dies. And so we did. And, he, and we were able to lead him to the Lord. And the pastor baptized him. It was a glorious thing. And I, I wish I could say to you that, and that everybody lived happily ever after. But Mr. Alexander was up in his, I think he was 80, and he was sick. And David was worried about him because he didn't think he had much time left. But he lived another five years. But a few weeks after that revival, while we were in seminary, David began to have severe headaches. He went to the doctor. They did certain examinations and found out he had brain tumor and it was malignant. And they put him in the Memphis hospital and he lasted almost as long as May Mabry did. He was 32, 30, 32, maybe, maybe that old. And he died, picture of health. But here's the ironic thing. Dave, David said to me, James, you make sure that you go by and see Mr. Alexander because he's sick, he's dying, he doesn't have long, he needs Jesus. And David lived just a few months after that. Death is no respecter of persons. We are not guaranteed of one more day. Oh, of course we know the elderly are going to die. We expect that. But if you go out on Booth Road today... Across from that Dollar General, Gum Springs Cemetery, right there close to the Booth Road, you'll see a little grave that is the grave of my sister-in-law that I never met, Beverly's little sister who died at birth, Joe Don Phillips. She died as an infant there are small graves and big graves young graves and old graves can I tell you the first funeral I ever preached as a preacher was a nine month old baby I was youth pastor and um, I got a, we got a phone call from uh, it was Daniel Funeral Home at that time, Roller Daniel now. And they said, we are uh, needing somebody to preach a graveside service. So there's a family that's passing through, and they don't have anything. They don't have any money. And we told them we would, their baby died. We told them that we would um, make sure that we had a service for the baby. And said, would you preach that service? I said, I will. So I met him at the funeral home. It's right where it still is today. I met the, the funeral director there. And he said, you can ride with me. And I got in the Cadillac with him. And I kept looking around for the hearse. And I kept looking around for her. And I said, where's the body? Where's the baby? 
And he just said, back there. And I looked in the back seat, and there's this little white casket. Back seat of that Continental or Cadillac, whatever it was. We get to the cemetery. He picks up the casket, carries it to the graveside. Some of you will remember Olivia Hambrick. How we had her funeral like less than two years old. Had her funeral right here on a Sunday afternoon. Death is no respecter of person. If you've got a watch, the ticking of your watch, every time you hear it tick, somebody is going out into eternity. While I am preaching right now, someone is dying. Someone is dying. How arrogant for us to think that we're going to be here tomorrow or next month or next year. Yeah, God's not against us planning. He's not against us making Uh, preparations for the future. He is against us living like we don't need God. He is against us living like we don't need to be ready to meet Him. We'll have our insurance. We'll have our will. But we won't have our life right with Almighty God because somehow or another we're disconnected thinking we're going to live forever. The Bible says this in Proverbs 27 verse 1, Boast not of tomorrow. For you do not know what a day may bring forth. I preach and always have as a dying man to dying people. Because that's what we are. We're all dying. I have preached the last sermon for a lot of people who've come to church, and the last message they heard was a message that I preached. One day you will hear the last message of your lifetime. One day I'll preach the last message that I will ever preach. That's why if you're going to do anything for God, listen to me, if you're going to do anything for God, do it now. If you're going to surrender to God, do it now. Do it today. If you're going to rededicate your life, do it today. If you're going to be saved, you've never been saved for eternity's sake. Be saved today. If you need to get something right with God, get it right today. If you need to join the church and go to work and serve here, do it today. If you need to recommit your life and say, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to work, do it today. I had a man tell me today, After the first service, I'm done running from God. I'm done being a lukewarm Christian. I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to be happy doing it because I know that's what he wants me to do. If you something that you need to do, do it. Do it. For heaven's sake, do it today. Do it now. If it's to get right with God, if it's to be saved, if it's to join the church, if it's to come for baptism, do it now. Because there is an assumption that nobody in this room should ever make. That you've got tomorrow. That you've got plenty of time. There is an urgency about this verse. There is an urgency about this week. If you drove by here Friday and Friday night and yesterday, there was an urgency about what was taking place here. Relatively young men gone. There is an assumption you and I should never make. What is it? That we have tomorrow. Whereas you do not know what will happen 
tomorrow. <laughs> For what's your life? A vapor that appears for a second, then vanishes away. You ever, you ever seen steam coming off of a cup of coffee? You ever tried to watch the steam as it comes off a cup of coffee? There it is. There it is. And then it just, as the kids used to say, it just disappeared. Just disappeared. Just disappeared out of. You turn, you blink, and it's gone. And that's the way life is. There is an assumption that we should never make. Let me be really quick, the last point. There is an activity we should never forsake. There is an activity that we should never forsake. And here it is, that we should obey God. There is an activity, there is something that none of us should ever forsake, and that's to be obedient. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Skip down to verse 17 and look at it. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's the activity we should not forsake. That is, what we know to do good, what we know is good and that we, are should, we should do it, we're not to forsake that. Because the person who knows to do good and fails to do it, sin. You know what most of us think? We think sin is things that we do. You know, we, we have this idea, we don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go with the girls that do, so we're okay. I want to tell you something. Sin is doing things you should not do. Commission. But sin is also not doing what you know you're supposed to do. And if you are here and saved and got a brain in your head, you know there are things that God requires out of all of us. And here's the question. Are we doing it? There is an activity that we should not forsake, doing what God tells us to do. He that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is sin. That's not how we categorize sin. That's what God says. The sum total of your life without Christ is sin. Listen to me, and I pray that those who are watching online will listen closely. Jesus Christ did not shed his blood on the cross. He did not go to hell for you and me for us to sit in a chair, to sit in our homes and do nothing. He has saved us and he has redeemed us for us to make our lives count. God help us who think that I'm saved, I've given my life to Christ, now I can just sit back and wait. No! You don't find that anywhere in Scripture. You don't find anywhere in the Word of God where you are to retire, that you are to quit. God saved you, redeemed you, so that you will serve Him. And, but yet people who don't serve, people who sin by omission, never see themselves as sinners. Look at that person. They're out clubbing. Look at that person. They've gone to Tunica. Look at that person. They drink like a fish. All of those things are wrong. I agree. Don't do those. But when you know what you are to do and you don't do it, I don't do it, it is sin. In fact, Jesus said it's a greater sin, the sin of omission, than the sin of commission. The greatest sin is to leave God out. Just leave God out. Put him on the back burner. 
Do you know the one sin that will send you to hell? Sin of omission. Hear me. You will not go to hell for what you do. You won't go to hell for what you do. You will go to hell for what you don't do. Because you see, Jesus can forgive you of all the sins you've done. The one sin that Jesus cannot even forgive you for is the one that you haven't done, and that is to receive him. If you, if you don't receive Jesus, it doesn't matter that he died on the cross for you and rose from the grave. If you just refuse to receive him, you say, no, I'm not going to do it, then that's the one sin that Jesus cannot forgive you for. That's the one sin that will send you to hell. It is the sin of commission. He that knows to do good and does not do it. To him it's sin. The Bible says in John 3, 18, he that believes is not condemned, but he that believes not is already condemned. Listen, if you're here today and you never trusted Jesus as your Savior, it's, you're not going to need to wait till you get to eternity to be condemned. You stand condemned already. There's a little track that says this. What you have to do to go to heaven. And you open it up and it says, A, B, C. Admit, believe, confess. Some of our kids did that this week. Simply admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus and confess with your mouth. And then on the other side it says, what do you have to do to go to hell? You open that side up, and it's blank. You know what you have to do to hell, go to hell? Nothing. 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 Don't do anything, and you'll go to hell. Don't accept Jesus. Don't trust him as your Savior. You'll go to hell. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how moral you are. I don't care how religious you are. If you don't accept Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell. He that believes not, he who's not put his faith and trust in Jesus, is condemned already. You'll say, preacher, you are right. You're right, and you know what? I'm going to do that later. Satan doesn't mind if you plan on making that decision someday, later, as long as you don't do it today, later. The biggest lie Satan uses later. George W. Truett, one of the great preachers, Southern Baptist Convention, he's in heaven now told a story about when he was a young boy he had given his life to Christ he had been saved and his church was having a, a month-long revival back in those days they had month-long revivals and he was he had a friend that he was burdened for that he wanted to see come to the revival and he went by to see his friend and invited him to the revival it was a summer revival, and his friend said, uh, not tonight, George. I'll do it later. George didn't give up. George W. Truett didn't give up. He went by the next night, and the next night, and the next night. He still got the same answer from the friend. Not tonight, George, later. He waited a couple days. He went back to see his friend, and his mother, the friend's mother, met him at the door and said, George, uh, it's probably not good for you to see him today. He's, he's sick. He needs his rest. He's running a fever. Come back in a couple of days, and maybe you'll feel better. George W. Truett didn't give up, and a couple of days later, he came back. When he came back, the doctor was there. And as the doctor was leaving the house, he had told this young man's mother that there was nothing else he could do. 
that he was going to die. He had gotten worse and worse, had some kind of virus, and he was going to die. And uh, the mother said, George, if you want to see him, you better go see him now. So George walked back to that friend's bedroom, and he sat down by him, and he said to his friend, would you give your life to Jesus today? You know what his friend said? N not now, George. Later. Uh, not now, George. Later. And he died just like that. George W. Truett said that after that young man's funeral, he got on his knees and he said to God, God, I'm going to dedicate my life to do everything I can that nobody else has to say, nobody else will be able to say, not now, George, later. They need Jesus. Let me ask you. I know you got a lot of stuff. And I know that you're successful. And I know all of those things. But what's going to happen one second after you die? One second after you die. As Keith Inman's body lay on his couch... His struggle was over, and he was with Jesus. He was a good one. As Mabe Mabry's body lay in that bed in the living room of their home, just the body, just the shell, he was at peace because he was with Jesus. He was one of the good ones. One second after you breathe your last, where are you going to be? One second after you die. Any regrets? You didn't do what you should have done. You knew you should do. You didn't go where you needed to go. You didn't give what you needed to give. You didn't witness like you needed to witness. You were not faithful like you needed to be faithful. You were not a member of a New Testament church like you knew you're supposed to be. Hey, what's your life? It's a vapor. One second after you die, it's over. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to take your holy word today and speak to our hearts. God, thank you for the truth of your scripture. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room is ready, that if their heart were to stop beating right now, if you were to come back and before 12 o'clock that they would be ready to go. But if there's somebody here today that's not ready, that's not right, that needs to get some things right, I pray that today would be the day that they would come. If there's people who need a church home, if there's people that need to follow you in baptism, if there are those who need to recommit their life, if there are those who need to move a membership, whatever it is, God, I pray that during these few minutes during this invitation that you would speak to hearts and move in lives in Jesus name I pray amen let's stand together we sing you come How wonderful away from God now I'm coming Ah! Uh -huh.
I'm trying. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home. Coming home. Nevermore to roam. Lord, and why? we've had already. Let me share these decisions with you. Sadie Claire, you and mom and dad come up here, please. Sadie Claire uh, comes today and she uh, talked to me just at, just before the service started today and she and her mom and dad uh, have a prayer time and family time and they've been talking about giving about her salvation. She's been bringing it up and uh, so in their home, which is so great, that's the best place to do it. In their home, uh, Sadie uh, asked Jesus Christ to come into her life and to save her. And she, she stopped me right over here this morning. And she said, I'm ready to come up there. So she came up there, and uh, she's here, and she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism and after that membership in our church. Isn't that great? If you receive her as she comes and you welcome her, give her an amen as you applaud. Amen. Sadie Claire, I'm so proud of you. 
I know mom and dad are proud too. God bless you. And then, Emma, you bring mom and dad up here. A few months ago, Emma came up um, with mom and dad. They had been talking to Emma about her giving her life to Christ, and Tanya counseled with her at that time. And she was just not quite ready at that time. And, you know, let me, let me just say this for everybody watching and everybody in here. Uh, we, we spend time with every child, every one that comes forward. We had some that came this week that Tori counseled with and I counseled with and Tanya counseled with and others that were not quite ready to make that decision. So we just told them, you know, you're, you're, uh, we'll talk to your mom and dad and we've given that information to them. We don't want anybody to make a decision unless we think they're ready after some wisdom. So Emma was not ready a few months ago, but she raised her hand this week in Bible school after talking to her mom and dad, and she prayed and asked Jesus into her heart. And uh, I, we met after Bible school on Wednesday night, and uh, she was ready, she was excited, and so she comes to as well, wanting you to know that she's trusted Jesus as her Savior, and she wants to follow the Lord in baptism. And if you rejoice that Emma has given her life to Christ, let her know it with an amen as you're applauding. Amen. Yeah. Okay, you come up here, Sadie Claire. Man, can you... Two pretty girls, right? Y'all come up here with them. Uh, you'll come by and give and, and uh, shake their hand and tell them how glad you are that they've uh, made this decision at baptismal services for some of them tonight. We've got the water already there. Nobody let the water out, okay? So it's in there. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, I um, want to invite you to be back to tonight at 5 o'clock. We have uh, 4.30 is... Uh, a meeting for those who are going to church camp, and um, so you be here for that. And then at 5 o'clock, we have a quarterly business meeting and some other things that we're going to be sharing about, so we'd love for you to come back and be here with us as we worship together. And you've got a bulletin for all the other activities. We had a great Bible school, and God has blessed. All right, I'm going to shake hands with some of you, and then I'm going to head to the hospital uh, because Beverly's getting ready here in a little while to have that conversion. So uh, thank you for your prayers for her. All right, let's bow together and let's be dismissed in prayer. Steve Gamble dismisses. <laughs>